We're in our series, I Believe, and we're focusing on Jesus today, particularly the exclusivity of Jesus as the only Savior. I'm showing you a picture of a Black Lives Matter protest, and there are two people in that picture that I want you to see. One of those people in that picture is a participant in the Black Lives Matter movement, and this person is concerned about uh, the African-American race, about his or her people. Concerned that they have been subjugated, that they have been treated as a lesser class, that they are being victimized, and this person wants equality. This person simply wants their people, black people, to be treated on the same level as any other ethnic group. No more and no less. Their concern is equality. There's another person in that picture. They too have observed that their people, black people, have been subjugated, have been stepped on, have been victimized, and have been abused. Their concern is not equality. Their concern is exclusivity. They want their ethnic group to be higher than all other ethnic groups, to receive privileges that are more than all of the other ethnic groups, and actually for their group to be above the rule of law in our country, to be able to do what they want without being accountable for it. That person's interest is exclusivity. We are special and we deserve to be treated as special. When it comes to our society, one of those people is more helpful and one of those people is more hurtful. When it comes to civil rule and law, what we want to be bound by as different ethnic groups and races and classes and genders is equality, not exclusivity. We don't want one race able to control another. We want equality. The opposite is true when it comes to what Jesus is saying today. Jesus doesn't want equality. Jesus, God did not make you and me to be equal with him. God is above us. He's superior to us. And so he wants the right to be our Lord and our Savior and to tell us something. And we say, oh, okay, I'll, I get that. I'll do that even if I don't understand or agree. So when it comes to spiritual matters, not civic matters, but spiritual matters, we don't want equality. We want exclusivity. For God to have the right to be your Savior and your Lord. Now, the difficulty with that, that teaching in, in the Bible is not understanding it. It's not a difficult teaching to understand at all. It's very clear in the Bible. The difficulty is in practicing it. So if you have your Bible, your Bible app, if you turn to John chapter 3, verse 36, you're going to hear some words of Jesus about exclusivity when it comes to spiritual matters. While you're finding that, back in ancient times in the Old Testament, God repeatedly made claims like this one from Isaiah. I am God and there is no other. That says it all. Then Jesus in John 3 verse 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. All others who claim to be God are not God, are counterfeit gods, just like counterfeit money. They look like gods, they sound like gods, people even re rely on them as gods, but they have no value. All religions who deny Jesus as Savior and as Christ and as Lord and as true God do not have Jesus. All religions who renounce him, all religions who redefine him to be someone other than who he really is, true God and true man, savior of the world, don't have Jesus and therefore don't have God and don't have the life that God wants to give everyone. They have God's wrath and eternal hell. That's very clear. If you let scripture be scripture and Jesus be Jesus, that's very clear. It's not difficult to understand, but it's difficult practice. It's difficult to practice in two ways. 
Here's the first. When exclusivity is on the table and it involves me and I'm, I'm part of the, the group that's in, it's very easy for people to feel superior to others and to belittle them and to treat them with, without respect and lower than they deserve, to minimize them and, and to dismiss them. Let me give an example. When, when you're in a competition, maybe you're playing a game with your family or you're in a race and you win. You're the winner. You're first place. First place can be difficult to handle because in our hearts we tend to be proud and we look at everyone else who's not us as losers. That's exclusivity in a hurtful way. Or first class people like us who live in, in first class homes with first class air conditioning and drive first class cars and we observe people who aren't first class like us. They're homeless people and they're asking for handouts. And one of the thoughts that easily enters a person's heart is, well, I wonder how they screwed up to be where they are and they don't have it all together like I do. So I'm not like them and they're not like me. As a matter of fact, if they just go out and get a job, everything would be okay. And we stereotype them or people who are even benefiting from the welfare system in our country as good-for-nothing freeloaders, every single one of them, right? With a broad stroke of a brush, we paint them all with the judgmentalism that can come from exclusivity. That's what makes it dangerous and difficult. Let me give you some questions to ask yourself to evaluate in your heart about how you have handled exclusivity as a Christian who believes in Jesus and are on the right side of this game, okay? It's still difficult and dangerous. Have I been so concerned about what I believe that when someone else has questioned it or criticized it, I have responded and reacted disrespectfully or unlovingly to them? It's all about winning the argument, and I don't really care about the person. Do I easily stereotype others who aren't part of my belief system and I look down on them as less spiritual or less godly than I am? Even other Christians from other church denominations. Am I so comfortable in my exclusive world sharing with my church friends, hang out in the lobby, drinking coffee, Facebook friends, going to each other's homes, and I'm so comfortable with that 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 makes me comfortable disrespecting and dismissing unchurched people and people who don't believe in Jesus. And it's okay, I can live with that because I'm happy with my church friends. That's an example of exclusivity in a hurtful way. Here's the second way it's difficult or dangerous. It's very easy for us to say, to point to other religions and say, you don't have Jesus as your Savior, therefore you don't have God and you don't have life in God. You don't, he's not your way, he's not your truth, he's not your life. See, and so we tend to love exclusivity when it comes to others, but not to us. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus says to me, Darren, I am, the, I am your way and your truth and your life. And I think, great Jesus, but I like my way. I, I'm enamored of my own opinion, my truth. And, and I want to make my life what I want it to be. So that's where I don't like the exclusivity that, that Jesus says he is. I tell others they should believe in the exclusive gospel of Jesus, and yet I have, a, I have trouble doing that myself. I tell Jesus, you know what? I, I have a way, and it's, it's the way that I like. And, and, and when other people observe me, and they see that what's, what's most important to me is my way, how are they supposed to see Jesus the true way? And when people observe me and they, they see I'm just so enamored of my own opinion, my opinion, what I think is golden and that's what's important, how are they supposed to see Jesus 
as the only truth. And when they observe me and my life doesn't look any different than all the worldly people out there who don't believe in Jesus, how are they supposed to see Jesus as the only life? Yeah, I say, Jesus, you're the way and the truth and the life. I want you, Jesus, and my way. I want you, Jesus, and my truth. I want you, Jesus, and my life. Jesus will never be one of many saviors, and he will not be second place savior. Anyone who wants Jesus in that way will not have Jesus, and he will not let it happen. So, let's be like Thomas. Thomas, that disciple of Jesus that you heard that we read about, where he questioned Jesus, where Jesus was talking about the way, and Thomas right, said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? You have to understand this. Three chapters earlier in John chapter 11, Thomas pledged his loyalty and his life to following Jesus. Thomas said to Jesus, Jesus, I am willing to die with you. And now that same man is saying, I, I don't know where you're going. I, that's what happens when, when we struggle like Thomas for Jesus and, and we struggle letting Jesus be our everything, struggle letting Jesus define everything for us, struggle giving our everything to Jesus and trusting Jesus with everything. You and I struggle with that, and Thomas did too. And when I'm not letting Jesus be everything, when I'm not willing to give him everything, when I don't trust him with everything, that's when life gets confusing. That's when we don't know the way. And we say, Jesus, I I don't know where you're taking this, and I, 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 I don't understand. And it's not a lack of information. It's a lack of heart. It's a lack of willing to live the exclusivity that we preach to others. And so we struggle like Thomas did. Jesus, your way is is too much. It's too unknown. It's too uncomfortable. It's too hard. Will you be willing to be Thomas's this morning with me? And come to Jesus and be honest. That was the best part of what Thomas said. Thomas just laid it out there. He was straightforward with Jesus. He was transparent with him, willing to confess, willing to ask. So I want you to do that with me now. I want you to repeat after me and be Thomas's with me. Jesus, I am sorry. Jesus, I am so sure of my way that I have lost your way. Jesus, I am struggling. Jesus, I am scared. And Jesus says, I am your way and your truth and your life. I am, when Jesus says that word, he he says it seven or eight or nine times in the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus says those words, it's it's a big ringing bell for everyone to notice that Jesus is saying, I am the true God. Because those those words, I am, they reflect the name of God in ancient times, Yahweh in the Old Testament. That's what God was called. The literal meaning is to be or self-existing one. 
Jesus is claiming to be true God and the only God with those words, with I am. And that's not just a claim, that's a promise. As the self-existing one, Jesus is not owned by anyone outside of God. He's not owned by your sin. He's not owned by your fears. Jesus is not controlled by anyone or anything outside of God. He's not controlled by any political candidate. He's not controlled by the economy in our world. He's not controlled by death or disability. He's not controlled by any of the worldly problems that plague our lives. None of them. He is free. Free to be who he wants to be. Free to choose whom he wants to be with him. And who is he? And who does he choose? Jesus says, I am your way. And Jesus comes to you and he brings you to the Father. Like a little girl so eager to bring her daddy to, to show him something, Jesus brings you to his daddy, to your, to your heavenly Father. And he's so eager to bring you there to the Father's love. He's so glad that as you follow Jesus and, and give him your hand and your heart and trust him to be the way, that you're less enamored about your lesser ways and smaller ways. And you follow his way. Keep in mind also that when Jesus says he is the way, he's not just prescribing for you a path to follow, like giving you a crossword puzzle and saying, okay, if you can figure this out, then you're going to understand me and you're going to be right with God. When Jesus says, I am the way. So he'll come to you and say, follow me, but, but there are also times where he won't say, follow me. He'll just carry you. He'll pick you up like a little lamb and carry you. Because he is the way. And he'll carry you when you're weak and when you're tired and when you're overwhelmed and even when you're lazy and sinful. Jesus says, I am your truth. And amidst all your confusion and all your just being so interested in your own opinion, Jesus doesn't withdraw and say, I've heard enough. I don't want to hear anymore. Jesus comes close to you and he communicates to you himself as the truth. He communicates in, in God's word and so you'll hear his voice in God's word. And sometimes that's a voice that speaks gently. I'm here. Don't be afraid. Sometimes it's a voice that speaks strongly to your enemies, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes it's a voice that is correcting. Sometimes it's a voice that's encouraging. But it's always a voice, always a voice in the Scriptures that is true and reliable and authoritative. Jesus is making you a promise here that as you Follow him and, and accept in faith Jesus as the embodied truth about everything. That anything in your life that you're experiencing, any struggle, any problem, anything that's broken, anything, make it a spiritual issue and Jesus will give you the answer that you need. Always. And he says, I am your life. Jesus says, I am, I am your life. He watches us try to, try to piece our lives together, try to, try to make life what we, what we want it to be, what we think it should be, and, and try to find a place to fit him among all our other priorities. And ah, sometimes we're not fitting him in that top spot as priority. And, and he doesn't walk away. He comes and he gauges with us. Even before... We can treat him as first place all the time. He treats you and me as first place. He puts us first and he dies and he rises for us and he will come again and we are number one. And in his dying and rising for us, Jesus awakens in us this desire that, that we're willing to die to. 
Here's uh, a devotion that I read this week, said it this way. It's talked about our dying, willing to die when we're following Jesus in the tr- in true life. Dying to trivial comforts and soul-shrinking conveniences. Dying to arrogant preferences and self-centered entitlements. And living for something much larger than what wakes us comfortable. Living for God. The direction of this, my study for this sermon and, and, the, and just the... The thrust of it surprised me a little bit as I was putting it together. And maybe it surprised you too. I didn't spend so much time today emphasizing how important it is that we support and defend the exclusivity of Jesus as the only only Savior. That's very true. I didn't instruct you on the best answer that you can give to someone who says, aren't all religions equal paths and don't they lead to the same God? Why are you so intolerant? I, I didn't give you any instructions or helps about how to respond to people, and yet I did. Because what I wanted to do is, through a devotional approach to exclusivity, I wanted you to examine your own heart and then to build your heart up and to build you up from the inside so that you are more firmly following Jesus as the only way, as the only truth, as the only life. And when you are willing to not be so dependent on your way in order to be happy because Jesus is your way, then other people are going to see that and they'll want Jesus to be their way too. And when you're willing to back off of your opinion as being so golden so that others can see Jesus as the truth, then they're going to want to follow Jesus as their truth too. And when others can see you and observe you and and what you make important in your home and your heart and and in your life and they they, they see that in you and they see that you're different because of Jesus, they're going to want the life that Jesus offers too. And maybe, just maybe, when other people see us as Christians living and behaving in that way, they won't even need to ask about the exclusivity of Jesus and why he's the only one. Because they'll believe in him just like us. Amen. Let's pray about that. Jesus, uh, we search our hearts today and we confess that we want to be our own way and our own truth and our own life too often in, in too many ways. So we're encouraged today as you come close to us and that you, you reframe how we see exclusivity and you remind us that it's powerful, not just as a pointed finger at others, but powerful in our own hearts and lives. Help each of us today live and believe the truth and follow in new ways this week and for the rest of our lives so that you are utmost exclusive in our life and faith and others can see it too. May our worship today and the words that you have spoken to us lead us forth for another week. Amen.